perfection that pleases God. A young woman who had completed her college education and was in a pretty good job was asked the question why she was not yet married. And she responded, I am waiting on Mr. Perfect. You see, she had a good uh, mental picture of the man that would make her happy. The man that would make her dreams come true. The man that would love her no matter what. He would be loving, kind, gentle, and compassionate. Her friends told her that she was dreaming. And she needs to get back to reality. But it didn't matter to her. She was confident that Mr. Perfect would come along one day. And so she waits. Yes, my brothers and my sisters, there are individuals who are looking for the perfect woman. They are individuals who are looking for the perfect man. But the truth is, Without divine intervention, crafting this perfection in a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl, none will possess it. What is the biblical standard and reference for the perfection that pleases God? What is the standard of perfection against which we are all measured? A good place to start is Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. The scripture reading that was beautifully done. So Jesus says, Therefore, you shall be what? Perfect. Just as your heavenly, just as your father in heaven is perfect. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. My brothers and my sisters, it is evident that it is not possible for any man to be as perfect as our heavenly father. Why? Because the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So then, what does Jesus really mean when he counsels us to be perfect just as our Heavenly Father is? What is the process, if there is one, that makes possible this perfection becoming a reality in our lives. And what does it look like to those looking on? Using the Bible, we are going to explore answers to these questions. Amen? A good place to start is John chapter 15. May I invite you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, we can identify the process which will give rise to that perfection that pleases God. John chapter 15 and verse 5. Jesus declares, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Here, my brothers and my sisters, Christ presents himself as the vine and us as the branches. To those who are connected to him as the, as the branch is connected to the vine, Receive the source of life that leads to 
spiritual growth and development. Then Jesus makes an important statement that cannot be overlooked. He says, without me, you can do nothing. You know, there are many persons who, who uh, there are many Christians who, who go about trying to be good. All by themselves, by their own power. But Jesus declares, without me, you can do nothing. And those who have attempted to accomplish this, this, this look, this appearance of being a perfect child of God turns out to be hypocrites. Because Jesus declares, without me, you can do nothing. There is no shortcut to the process. Oh, my brothers and my sisters. In the absence of connecting to Jesus Christ, it is impossible to attain the perfection referred to in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48. When we are connected to Jesus Christ in constant praise, prayer, and Bible study, something extraordinary happens. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, the apostle tells us that it is the Holy Spirit that pours out the love of God within our hearts. That, my brothers and my sisters, is significant because there is no other way of receiving that love. This is significant because this love, when poured out in our hearts, establishes a vertical connection with heaven, a vertical connection with God. This vertical connection, my brothers and my sisters, give rise to the outflow of love on the horizontal level. Thus fulfilling Jesus' command to love our neighbors as ourselves. This love is poured out in our hearts, makes it possible to love even the unlovable. But there are many Christians who claim to love. But as soon as a brother or a sister step on their toes, they are ready to punch them over. It's a testimony that they have not allowed the Holy Spirit to pour out the love of God within their hearts. Why? Because the Bible tells us that our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. By design, God uh, uh, requires that the Holy Spirit lives within our soul temple. Here is the challenge, my brothers and my sisters. We have to create a conducive environment so that he will want to stay there. The problem is that for many Christians, there are so many worldliness that occupies the soul temple, the mind, so that the Holy Spirit finds it uncomfortable to remain there. So he leaves. And when the Holy Spirit leaves, the soul temple becomes desolate. Oh, my brothers and my sisters. John, in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, the apostle says, He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. How can one claim to be a child of God, to be a Christian, and hates his brother? or his sister, or his neighbor. There is no love in such a heart. That individual, that professed Christian, have not been connected to Christ Jesus. 
Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Those who profess to be children of God, but hates a fellow church member or a neighbor are only pretenders. Do you have, do we have many, many uh, Christian pretenders? Oh, yes, we do. We do. The apostle refers to them as having a form of godliness, but denying the power of God to transform their lives. In fact, in, in uh, uh, Second uh, Timothy chapter uh, 3 and verse 5, that talks about that, he says that uh, in the latter part of the verse, he says, and from such people turn away. Why? Why we should turn away from such individuals? Because we run the risk of adopting their, li their living, their pretentious attitude. So he says, be careful of your association with these uh, Christian pretenders. They love, but only in words. Be careful of these uh, Christian pretenders because you're likely to adopt these practices. On the other hand, on the other hand, when we are connected to the vine, Christ Jesus, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 becomes our testimony. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. What should be or what will be our testimony when we are connected with Jesus Christ? When you're there, say amen. And so in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, the apostle says, I have been crucified with Christ. And that means, my brothers and my sisters, it means totally surrendering to Jesus Christ unreservedly so that he occupies our soul temple. Continuing, the apostle says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And what does that mean? You see, when we are connected to Christ, that which was impossible, the new man, the new creation becomes a reality now. Why? Because Jesus now dwell within the soul temple in the person of his Holy Spirit. So, so those that are looking on, what they see or what they are seeing is a manifestation, my brothers and my sisters, of the transforming power of God at work within us. It is not about me. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus shining through us to the world. When, when, when this is fulfilled, Jesus' command, or when this happens, Jesus' command in, in uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 becomes a reality. When Jesus says, let your light so shines before men. That what? They may see your good works and glorify who? Not you, but your Father in heaven. But you know something very interesting about that passage of scripture? Jesus says, let your light so shine. What it reminds you of? It takes you back to the week of creation. When, when Jesus says, let there be what? Light. I want you to understand that when Jesus says to us in Matthew chapter uh, 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine. He is, not, he is not presenting to us, my brothers and my sisters, a, a recommendation, an option. It is a command. Let your light so shine. And why is it that Jesus can say that to us? Because we claim to be his children. He can only say that to those who are his children. Let your light so shine so that your husband can see Christ shining through you. So that your wife can see Jesus shining through you. So that your children 
can see Jesus shining through you. So that your neighbor can see Jesus shining through you. Let your light so shine. And can I tell you, my brothers and my sisters, that the light should first start shining within the home. Oh, my brothers, continuing the text, he says, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when you look at the person who is connected to Jesus Christ, you are seeing someone who is being transformed. So how then do you explain the person who has been in the church for 5, 10, 25, and 30 years and remains the same as the day they came? Hmm. Very interesting. The process of achieving that perfection that pleases God begins with getting connected to Jesus Christ and surrendering totally to him so that he fully occupies our soul temple and notice i said fully occupying our soul temple because jesus makes it absolutely clear that th- th- there there can't be no part-time relationship in your christian in in your in your commitment to god he says you will either you will love one and hate the other There can be no part-time relationship. It's either full-time or no time at all. So it begins with getting getting connected with Jesus Christ. When this becomes our reality, that is getting connected with Jesus Christ, the character traits which signals the Father's perfection will be manifested in and through us. Let Let me say that again. When we are connected to Jesus Christ, the character traits which signals the Father's perfection will be manifested in and through us. So what does this perfection look like? Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. After today, you will no longer be confused about uh, that statement Jesus made. um, Be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Because today, you will have an understanding of what is expected of us. When we are connected to Jesus Christ. What the perfection should look like. Are you there? Galatians chapter 5. And we're, going, we're starting with verse 22. And Jesus said. And the, the apostle says. But the fruit. And notice the singularity of it. Not fruits but what? Fruit. But the fruit of the spirit is what? Love. And can I tell you my brethren. It. The love has to be the first one because love is the binding agent that brings all the other all the other elements together in a unifying way. For those of you, when when you're making dumpling, right, Uh, and and for the for those who are health conscious, they like to have in their in their dumpling a lot of cornmeal and some put. uh, other things there. My wife put a whole lot of other things there. But the flower is the binding agent. Am I right? Love is the binding agent that binds all the other elements that we're going to be looking at now. And the second one is what? Joy. There can be no joy if there is no love. What's the other one? Peace. There can be no peace, my brothers and my sisters, if there is no love. (laughs) Long suffering. There will be no long suffering if in the absence of love. And then it goes on. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are character traits 
of our Heavenly Father. When we become connected to Jesus Christ through the working of His Holy Spirit, these traits will be manifested in and through us. The Bible refers to it as the new creation, the new man. It is a supernatural transformation. It is not something that is intrinsic. It is not something that we can accomplish in and of ourselves. It is impossible. But the Bible tells us, with God, all things and all things good are possible. And when we have Jesus within our hearts, the husband will be more loving. There will be no more abuses. The wife will be more loving. No more disrespect. Hmm? The children will be respectful because love is in the home. Love is in the heart. My brothers and my sisters, this is where it's at. This is what God wants to be a reality in our lives. This is what many professed Christians are lacking today. And the lack is as a result of being disconnected from Jesus Christ. Many families are in a devastating situation. Emotionally, mentally, the problem that exists between the wife and the husband lends itself or causes the children to become mentally ill. Oh my God. And the parents are professing to be children of God. The home is supposed to be a place of love, but they are running away. I'm talking about Christian children running away from home. As parents... We have a stewardship responsibility to take care of and to educate the children that God has given to us as a gift. The Bible makes it clear that they are a what? A, her a, a, a heritage, a gift from God. And while many parents are preparing to go to heaven, neglecting their parental response, stewardship responsibility to their children, I'm, I'm, Ellen White says one of the first questions that will be asked of them, where is the little flock? Parents don't recognize, Christian parents don't recognize that they are preparing their girls to become good wives. Their sons to become good husbands. And when they live at war, when the wife and the husband live at war in the home, they are setting an example for those young minds. And they grow up believing that abuse, verbal, physical abuse, is acceptable even as children of God. Parents, have you stopped to consider what you're doing to your children? But it's not happening here. You're all good parents. But my brothers and my sisters, we have a major problem among the people of God. And these young people grow up to establish relationships, broken and bitter relationships, because they lack the skill 
to have a relationship that is after the order of God's design. Children are becoming mentally ill. Yes, that is happening out there in the world, but we do not expect that to be happening to Christian children. Is it impossible to achieve this, these character traits? Is it possible to have them in our lives? A reality in our lives? We said earlier, in and of ourselves, it is impossible. Here's the reason people don't want to be fully connected to Jesus Christ. They don't want to, they don't want him to dictate where they should go, what they should wear, what they should heat, and all that, these kind of, they don't want that. They want a lifestyle, uh, doing their own thing. They prefer to have a part-time relationship with God. And that can't work. And so because the desire is to have, do their own thing and have this part-time relationship. Family worship is non-existent. Non-existent in the home. How can you keep demons out of your home if you don't have family worship? The family in ancient Israel, they were required to have a morning and evening sacrifice. Start the day with God. Ends the, and end the day with God. We do that with the family altar. We start the day with God. And we end the day with God. When, when, when we have the family altar fully established in the home. My brothers and my sisters. The demons are kept at bay. They are uncomfortable in the presence of God. And so you will not likely to find the tug of war and the cussing and the bitterness among family members in the home where there is regular praise, prayer and Bible study going on. Because the restraining power of God keeps at bay the demonic forces. There are some Christians who, because they have been praying, or they claim to be praying, and things not happening, and they're going through many issues. They ask the brethren to pray for them, but nothing appears to be happening. They ask the elder, the pastor, to pray, but nothing is happening. And so the devil would have placed at the right time advisors to say to them, listen, man. You need to have that check out. That not normal. And so like King Saul. They go visiting the witch of Endor. Oh my brothers and my sisters. When all that is needed. Is to be connected. To Jesus Christ. And their problems. Would have been solved. King Saul. Wanted to have. A part-time relationship. And that led him down the path of destruction. And many today are not learning from his example. First, Second Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17 tells us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is connected to Christ, he is what? A new creation. All things are what? Passed away. Behold, all things have become new. But that is only possible after the connection is established. As I come down to a close, my brothers and my sisters. Another manifestation 
of the perfection that is pleasing to God can be found in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 14. 14 and 15. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. In other words, God's willingness to forgive us is dependent on our willingness to forgive others. And yet you have, I don't know if that's happening here in Stanton. You have some church members who are keeping malice, not just for a week, but you have some keeping malice for years. And then in some of our churches, they make the mistake of asking such a person to do the intercessory prayer. Oh, sweet Jesus. It reaches no further than the roof because God will not listen to the petition of someone who is harboring bitterness in their hearts for another. It doesn't matter. There must be a willingness to forgive those who have wronged you. Husbands. There must be a willingness in your heart to forgive your wife, regardless of what happened. And more so the husband, because he is the spiritual leader of the home. When we go back to, to, to the Garden of Eden, who first had sin? The woman, Eve. But when God came in the cool of the evening, whom did he call to give an account? I'm saying to you, men, husbands, you are the spiritual leader and God will hold you responsible for what happens in your home. Yes, you might say it's the wife. Adam did just that. But it was Adam who God called to give an account. Husbands, you can't be planning to take revenge on your, on your wife. You, you can't be planning to, to be, be, because she upsets you, you're not going to give her the allowance. You, you're not going to. What is that? And when the husband does that, the Bible makes it clear that the head of Christ is who is the head of Christ? God is the head of Christ. Am I right? That's what the Bible says. And the head of the man is Christ. And the head of the woman is man. All right. Come with me. Do you recall Jesus saying, when you see me, you've seen the Father? Do you recall Jesus saying, I and my father are one? Jesus was a perfect reflection of his heavenly father. The husband is supposed to be a reflection of his head, Jesus Christ. If he is not reflecting Christ, if he is not a true representative of Christ to his family, he becomes disqualified for being the head. And so, husbands, you should lead in calling for family worship in the morning. You should lead in calling for family worship in the evening because you are the spiritual leader. You should lead in saying, I am sorry when you're wrong. If, you, if you're unable to do that, if you think that's beneath you, 
then you can't be Christ's representative. And if you're not Christ's representative to your family, you're not qualified to be the head of the home. God would not have somebody who is taking orders from the devil lead his daughter. Whoa. Wives. Wives. So the Bible says, wives, reverence your husband. And what that means really is to show respect for your own husbands. Am I right? What's hard in that? It's not a reasonable request. Yes, respect your husband. Have you considered that when a wife disrespects her husband indirectly, she is disrespecting his head, who is Christ? I'm saying to the wives present today, God requires of you to be loving, to be respectful, and to honor him in the home. Support your husband in that which is good. Husbands, support your wife. That is your calling. That is God's expectation of you in that which is good. Because God requires that we set an example for our children. And in doing so, we are setting good examples for them. So that they will not find it or feel that it is beneath them when they are wrong to say, I am sorry. Why is it so hard for, Christian, for some Christians to say, I am sorry, when they are at fault? This false pride that they possess will not lead them to fall on their knees. Will not lead them to say, I am sorry. Many problems in the home. If at the outset, one party was willing to say, I'm sorry. It would have saved many marriage relationships. Oh, my brothers and my sisters. So God calls us. He says, for my children, this is the character traits that I want to see manifested in you. Of yourselves, it is impossible. But through Christ, when you're connected to the vine, Christ, it is possible. You'll be more loving. You'll be more joyful. You'll be more peaceful. You'll be more long-suffering. You'll be kind. There'll be a lot of goodness. There'll be a lot of faithfulness. You'll be gentle in how you deal with others, your church members, your family members, your neighbors. 